Close your eyes and imagine it with me. A dried line of salty sweat that has dripped down your neck from behind your ear. The creaky sound of a rocking chair on a porch as an old woman watches you walk by. A post office so covered in kudzu vines that you can't tell if it's been closed for a month or years. Southern Gothic as a genre is a love letter to the Southern United States. It holds stories set from anywhere between the Blue Ridges in West Virginia and Texas, where everything is bigger. Um, sorry, the Blue Ridges in West Virginia and Texas, where everything is bigger. Those two aren't the same place. Uh, now, when I say love letter, I don't mean that the genre seeks to romanticize this area. Rather, it seeks to dissect it. And in particular, Southern Gothic literature was born out of a desire to pick apart the favorite myths of antebe antebellum Southerners who had an idealistic vision of what the South looked like in a God-centered post-Civil War America. Of course, the genre has developed since then um, and continued to sort of critique and explore the motifs that we kind of associate with the South and uh, with the sort of dark parts of American history. So Flannery O'Connor, a bit of a con controversial figure, but really one, the, one of the founding fathers of this genre uh, wrote this quote. And bear with me because I think it has kind of defined how I see the genre. Whenever I'm asked why Southern writers particularly have a penchant for writing about freaks, I say it is because we are still able to recognize one. To be able to recognize a freak, you have to have some conception of the whole man. And in the South, the general conception of man is still in the main theological. That is a large statement and it is dangerous to make it for almost anything you can say about Southern belief can be denied in the next breath with equal propriety. But approaching the subject from the standpoint of the writer, I think it is safe to say that while the South is hardly Christ-centered, it is most certainly Christ-haunted. The Southerner who isn't convinced of it is very much afraid that, may, that he may have been formed in the image and likeness of God. So Southern Gothic stories are about decay of buildings, of small towns, of people, of societal values. Um, and this decay leaves sort of like a haunting aftertaste in your mouth. It's got a lot of motifs and tropes as any genre would. And I think it's something that deserves a lot of criticism as well as praise. Um, and in particular, we have a lot of interesting subgenres that are starting to come out of Southern Gothic. Um, in particular, Black Southern Gothic is a subgenre that uh, really interrogates the way that a lot of black characters and histories tend to be overgeneralized and overlooked. And I think that's probably produced some of the best stories to come from this literary tradition and a lot of them coming out years after its initial or sorry, initial conception with uh, people like Flannery O'Connor or William Faulkner is another big one that people will point to. I've also seen Edgar Allan Poe described as Southern Gothic, which is interesting because I wouldn't have thought of that, but I guess it's true. So this week, before we get started with the books, I wanted to kick it off with our question, and then we can get into uh, some of the lovely uh, titles, or maybe not so lovely titles, that my reading friends have picked out for us. So this is my question to all of you. If you could pick one detail from the town that you grew up in, or a town you moved to, it doesn't have to be the one you grew up in, and turn it into a horror or gothic or dark themed story, what would it be? All right, well, I guess I'll go first since everybody is not going. Um, so I remember um, when I live in Hong Kong and there's two ways to get home. I live on a hill and there's two ways to get home. One way is through this creepy elevator that goes through a, par uh, a restaurant and then a parking lot. And then it will be halfway up the hill and then I have to go back up the hill um, to get to my house. The other way is to go through this equally creepy stairs that go all the way up to the hill that ends you in a playground um, and then sort of near the top. And uh, that is like a, a 200 steps, 300 steps kind of stairs that I can hike up every day. And I think that staircase would be like the 
best place for whatever is going to happen. Because I always imagine that as, because the way you can't really see up the top when you're like starting on the stairs, that maybe some, like one day, whatever is up there is going to be completely different. Um, I will, it will lead me to some other random place. And also throughout that, that trip, anything could happen because you're just on a staircase all by yourself. So anything could happen. Just weird things could pop up. So I think that is like the best place. And I think by the time I get up there, I, I can just imagine something weird is waiting for me up at the top. So Lovely. Lovely. Um, I don't really know where to start with mine because there were several haunted areas in my hometown, including uh, behind our regular elementary school was like a dilapidated old schoolhouse with like the windows boarded up and it was made out of wood and you were, it just sat there where you could imagine all manner of horrible things happening. Um, but I think I'm going to choose an event that periodically happens in my hometown about every 10 years to kind of depending on the cycle is that there is an invasion of tent caterpillars and not just any regular caterpillars they're about like that long they're kind of blue and spotted and when i say an invasion i mean that they cover the ground the road is slick with them as you walk along on the ground, you hear the popping of their skeletons with every single step that you take. Your clothing is just like covered in the goo of their entrails. And I remember one extremely particularly bad year is that when we uh, drove our car into our driveway, we lived in the middle of the forest. And of course, all the trees are bare. So it's the middle of summer and there is not a leaf to be found. And I remember turning the corner like slightly skidding on the skeletons of the caterpillars as you kind of fishtailed your way to the driveway and coming to see our house that was twitching. It was twitching with the movement of thousands of caterpillars. The entire house was undulating with their movement. So it's not an imagination that <laughs> it's just like the horror movie that has already happened. Yeah, I'm not phased by much because I've already lived through a horror movie. It's fine. So mine is not remotely nuanced. Um, I grew up in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Um, and you may know it by its reputation for violence. Uh, it's actually, it's a beautiful, like wonderful, wonderful place that has a lot going for it, but it does have a violence problem. Uh, and in particular, a knife problem. Um, and the thing is like, you know, there's sort of, people will get jumped and then there's the fear of getting jumped. So you carry a knife and then there's just more knives and then there's just more violence. So it would like, yeah, like be it's just a very straightforward, like fear of people and that like going into your own head of like, you know, like if I, if I don't have a knife that I'm going to get knifed and then there's just more and more knives and like, I don't know, it would be called like knife town or something and just like be really have heavy handed. So for mine, mine's a little bit different. Um, so my hometown is Burnaby, and in Burnaby it has this sort of strange just juxtaposition between suburban sort of houses and then really small scale sort of like dilapidated farmland, like right next to it. So anyone who's ever taken like the 100 bus from like 22nd Street Sky Train, you'll go through this weird, almost rural area with these farms and houses from like. 50, 60 years ago that don't look like they've been taken care of very well, surrounded by the giant trees and vegetation and whatnot. And it's like, if you go down like a small off road, it looks like you could like just disappear and like fall off a cliff and no one would ever know that you disappeared through that specific crevice of a street. And it's always struck me as this weird sort of like area that never quite got developed later on. Whereas like other parts of Burnaby are like much more like, modern or like got like full on houses and things like that whereas this area just has sort of stayed the way it has been for many years and just seeing that just 
kind of reminds me of like the kind of dilapidated um, sort of scenery you see in a lot of Southern Gothic. Yeah, <laughs> those are all really cool. I think mine, most people um, might know the fact that I come from a place which has an area outside of town known as Chemical Valley. And so I think mine would be uh, like in a very Blade Runner sense, like it's a, if you see Chemical Valley, it looks like a, a, a sort of interesting sci-fi cityscape. But um, I think the big thing with mine is that it would have to be sort of an environmental message at its core, something very, uh, yeah, like we have created monsters because we've been mistreating things. Uh, and it would be based on a real event that I believe might have been fixed before I was born because I think it might have happened in the 80s, could have been in the 90s. Um, and the chemical runoff from the plants that was going into the river um, created a gelatinous blob at the bottom of our river. And so they had to uh, undertake this massive, um, this massive uh, project to sort of fix up um, and get rid of that blob. And so I think I would have, it would have to be about the blob in the river. The other alternate idea is also in the river, there are a lot of cars because we were a spot uh, where there were a lot of rum runners during the prohibition period and Al Capone has a house in Sarnia. So I feel like there's something to be done for like a, a little bit of a prohibition smuggling blob combination. Um, <laughs> And I think that would that would be the story that would be uh, told. In general, there is a tiny, tiny subgenre for Southern Ontario Gothic. It's been criticized for being just too realistic um, and actually just what happens in Southern Ontario um, as opposed to something that's maybe like stretching the truth a little bit. So I have seen that before. All right, and let's get into some of the different books that we have this week. Thank you for all of these horrifying tales of... <laughs> <laughs> growing up in various places, uh, the caterpillars in particular, and I hate that. Um, although the knives are maybe more of a practical fear, as you said. Um, Corrine. Combine you... the two. <laughs> we need to combine the two and make our own story. Knives caterpillars with knives. Caterpillars with knives. knives. Caterpillars yeah. with knives. Caterpillars lining the staircase that you were, or sorry, the, yeah, the stairs that you were going up. Right. The caterpillars are concealing a knife in their big mass. And then you just sort of see it slowly start to poke out and you see the kind of like glint. Find the little knife. Yeah. I'm imagining the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland, like the hookah caterpillar, but it's got a knife instead. Mm. All right. All right. I love this. Okay. This is the novel that we're going to come up with. We got it. We got it. Um, yeah. Awesome. So, <laughs> Kareen, what do you have for us this week? Well, first of all, Gabriel, I would like to thank you for uh, giving us a definition of Southern Gothic because I wasn't totally sure, but I definitely went to a book list that said it was Southern Gothic and picked something that I thought I might enjoy um, only because Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil was checked out by someone. And so congratulations to them on exquisite taste, but that's what I would have chosen because of crime. So instead I chose a mystery book. Um, so when you come to the Belleville, sorry, Bellevue plantation, you feel at peace. You might come to enjoy a wedding or a society function or some kind of soiree to celebrate someone giving a obscene amount of money to someone else. You come to this plantation to enjoy the glory years of the Old South. At least that is what the Clancy family would like you to believe. And by extension, Karen Gray, who manages the estate, would also like you to feel that because her job depends on it. Back to her old hometown after four years of trying to make it as a lawyer in New Orleans, Karen has returned to Bellevue to be the general manager after having grown up on the grounds of this plantation, running around free through all of the exhibits and the extensive grounds. In a sense, she has come home. 
her mother, uh, Helen, was the cook there for many, many years and who was very, very loyal to the Clancy family who has owned this plantation for generations. Helen cooked for the patriarch James Clancy, and even after he had retired and been sent to a home, every week drove an hour to bring him his favorite home cooking. She was so loyal that Karen almost began to suspect as a child that he might actually be her father. She grew up around the Clancy brothers, Raymond and Bobby, golden boys, heirs to fortune and farmland. But her roots to this land go deep, maybe even deeper than the Clancy's. Her grandparents and her great-great-grandparents and great-great-great-grandparents worked the sugarcane fields as enslaved people to the plantation and as freed people afterwards. And as much as Karen tried to escape this land, escape this place, go to New Orleans, find a nice guy named Eric who she thought maybe she was going to marry and start a family with her young daughter, Morgan. She just can't stay away. This place has a hold on Karen. And Karen knows all the secrets of this land, or so she thinks. She knows that what they show the tourists is not the whole story of this place. That in the old schoolhouse, they may put on a play three times a day for school children and various tourists with parts like slave number three or mammy. But Karen can feel the chill and the horror when she goes to inspect the slave quarters where six dilapidated sheds stand as a testament to the people who worked in the house and the land. And Karen knows that despite the layer of calm and tranquility of their small town in Louisiana, that there are tensions that run deep between the haves and the have-nots between the whites and the black community and between the townspeople who have been there for generations and the new immigrants that have been brought in to work the industrial farming that happens behind the plantation where the ancestors of those townsfolk farmed for generations and generations only to be kicked out by the new owners of the land. And so when a body is found in a shallow grave on the side of the plantation, Karen is not particularly surprised. She knows that it's only a matter of time before these secrets of the town come to surface. She knows that the body of the young girl, probably one of the temporary workers on the farm is going to cause things to come to the surface. But what she doesn't expect is that it will hit so close to home. The police know, and Karen knows, that one of her coworkers, one of the workers on the plantation, is tied to this crime. And she even begins to suspect that her young daughter, Morgan, who has hidden a blouse covered in blood in their house, in their room that they live in on the plantation might be involved. And as the police start to chase down the wrong people based on the wrong idea, Karen decides to dig deep into the mysteries of Belle B. The mystery of the dead girl and the longer mystery of the disappeared former slave that has haunted Belle B for years. And she discovers that the sins of the past might be haunting the present. This is one of the early thrillers by Attica Locke, who is probably most famous for Bluebird, Bluebird. And this is a grab you by your eyeballs, won't let you go thriller called The Cutting Season. The writing in this is so good and so sharp. Um, in kind of what you were talking about, Gabriel, that some of that, the most exciting writing in Southern Gothic is coming from these Black writers who are challenging that narrative of what the South is. Uh, she shines such uh, an incisive, critical eye at the idea that a plantation, an area where enslaved people 
were worked worked to death were owned by people is sort of a Disneyland for tourists that is somewhere that you would bring to have a good time or have a wedding um but she also because uh because she's such a good writer makes you realize that these places are also employing so many people and are so integral to the economy of those particular areas that it's it's hard to unpack for these communities um if you are looking for a southern gothic thriller mystery by I would argue one of the smartest writers out there in the genre. Um, Attica Locke, again, wrote Bluebird Bluebird, um, is a screenplay writer who wrote for Empire, um, is just an amazing, amazing talent. I would recommend that you pick up The Cutting Season. All right, I am going to add that to a list because that sounds amazing. And I think you're, you're very right in, I think it hits on almost all of the things that I really love about the Southern Gothic genre and the, I think like the criticisms, but also the understanding that comes with the South and the way that we look at its legacy. So thank you. That's really, that's really cool. And I'm not always a, I'm not always a thriller person, but I think for Southern Gothic, I will do it. <laughs> I will go for it. All right. Um, and Fiona, what do you have for us today? Yeah, so I have a brutal and extremely well-crafted book that totally took me by surprise. Um, so this is Sing, Unburied Sing by Jessmine Ward. Um, <clears throat> now this book opens with uh, the disembodiment of a goat, <clears throat> which was quite shocking. Uh, and honestly, I'm proud of myself for, for finishing the book when it started out that way. Um, the rest of the book is, is similarly brutal um, in its, its real, realistic depiction of, of life uh, for these characters. And, and and yeah, just the brutality of it. So our main character is Joseph or Jojo. Uh, he is a young man, only about 14, uh, who has had to take on much too much, in my opinion, for a 14 year old. Um, <clears throat> he, uh, his mother, who he refers to only as Leone, uh, is largely absent uh, and is a drug addict. Um, it, his relationship with her is perhaps worse than his incarcerated, uh, his relationship with his incarcerated father, because Leone is one of those figures who shows up when it suit, suits her. Uh, she can never be relied upon, but she's still pulling those emotional strings for Jojo. Jojo has a younger sister, Kayla, um, who uh, is the world to him and Jojo is the world to her. Uh, she's an, uh, a toddler and I, I always like when a toddler is written well uh, and Kayla is written very well and their relationship is, is extremely endearing but also very sad because we see um, how much Joseph is responsible at his young 14 years. There is also Pop, who is the apple of Joseph's, Joseph's eye. He is an upright man, um, hardworking with strong values, um, and Joseph loves that he has always been told that he is like Pop. And then there's Ma'am, who is dying of cancer. Uh, <clears throat> in a lot of ways, she has been um, the one who has held their family together, uh, and especially for Pop, who you know is the great love of his life. It's extremely difficult to see her as she fades away. This is actually a dual perspective book, which was quite interesting. I, I wasn't sure I was going to be into it because we also get Leone's perspective. Um, and it brought me back to our parenting episode because she's a horrible parent and she's a um a very very selfish character and i'm not sure like she definitely isn't meant to be sympathetic but i found that through her pov i actually was able to 
come to like her despite her being really just yeah a deeply deeply flawed and selfish character um so the only thing that leone cares about other than getting high is her uh, boyfriend and the father of michael uh pardon me the father of jojo and Kayla Michael, who is incarcerated. Um, she loves him so dearly. It's actually quite lovely <laughs> um, just how intensely she loves him. But of course, it, it makes her blind to everything else. Uh, the only other thing Leone has ever cared about in life is her brother, Given. Given's, and Given was uh, brutally murdered in what was um, called a hunting accident when uh, he went hunting with some white boys from his football team. Um, it actually was Michael, who is Leone's boyfriend's cousin, who uh, murdered Gibbon. So there is quite a complicated history between the families and Michael's uh, parents are honestly complete trash, uh, and um, so they haven't really met their grandchildren um, and are actively hostile towards Leone. So it a lot it it takes place over only a few days, and a lot of those few days are a horrible, horrible road trip to go pick Michael up from the penitentiary. Uh, <laughs> just everything goes wrong. Uh, they're stopped by the police. They they pick up uh, drugs along the way. Um, it's it's very upsetting to see these children in this situation. Um, uh, but they are are resilient, and somehow the characters just have this attitude that like like this is normal, and uh, and so you as the reader um, are just understand so implicitly how brutal this life is. Okay, uh, the last piece of the story is Richie. Um, Richie was a very young boy who was put in prison uh, for stealing because they had multiple uh, siblings who needed to eat. Uh, and so he ended up uh, in prison when Pop was there. Uh, and we presume that Pop's um, uh, offense was equally uh, as um, justified, you know, we don't we don't assume that he was there for like an actual crime, um, and it was Pop who who tried to take care of Richie, who at his young and tender age was just uh, so not fit to be in the prison, um, and and he was always looking over his his shoulder trying to protect Richie, so. What kind of took me to, by surprise is that this is actually a story about ghosts. Um, <clears throat> all of the um, the family members have some different um, some different magical abilities. Um, Jojo can can hear um, animals speak, which I actually loved so much because they don't like they're not like, "Hey, Jojo, how are you doing?" They're like, "Eat, give food." I eat you like very like I can imagine animals talking like that. Uh, so it wasn't like important for the the story, but I really appreciated the interpretation of what animals would say if they if you could hear them. Um, and um, Leone and Jojo also have the ability to see ghosts, uh, and we also find out what Kayla can do throughout the story. So um, I really loved how. Um, can't think what the, like, it, it was not at all heavy handed. Uh, I don't really like um, my magic to be detailed. Uh, I like it to kind of sit there under the surface. And it really like, it doesn't become important to tell the last quarter of the story. And this book is actually really a sort of a meditation on, um, on people who have died brutally, essentially. And and what what does that mean? How do we go forward from that um, when there are such, when black bodies are are violated and, and murdered in such brutal, horrible, horrible ways? Um, 
and what does it mean what does it mean to die when life itself is so difficult and brutal so again took me by surprise because i just i didn't expect that much from this book um and you know not usually my kind of thing but sing unburied sing absolutely amazingly crafted uh and and definitely would recommend if you are planning to read more southern gothic i also was not expecting the ghosts after that description i'm excited to hear that there were some animals speaking and also it does sound like one of those ones that i've i've definitely heard the name sing unburied sing before and i think i can understand why after hearing uh the description of some of the different themes and also the plot arc that it goes on um yeah so another another really great really interesting um southern gothic novel i think i'm actually going to go next and talk about a book that actually was the first southern gothic novel i ever read and uh i'm someone who actually loves rereading books. I love rewatching movies. I love replaying video games. I like revisiting the media that spoke to me or made an impression at different points in my life because I feel that even if I don't pick up something new from the story, I will sometimes pick up something new about myself once I've had some of that distance. So I decided that I wanted to go back a little bit and actually revisit this one again. Also partially because I was going to read Summer Sons and it was out. I did not plan ahead far enough in advance. If you want to read something, folks, make sure you put your holds on it well before it happens. So I figured let's go back to the classics. So this is an older book, but it was one that was made into a very good Netflix movie in 2020. So if anybody doesn't want to read it, you can also watch it. <laughs> And so I first read this back in high school. It's been quite a while. Um, and I wanted to revisit it both just because I sort of have a different brain now and also because uh, I had seen the Netflix movie and I liked both, but I remembered it being far more brutal than the movie. Maybe because of the fact that there are certain things that you can do in a book that you really just can't do in a movie if you want it to be palatable to a bigger audience. And so that's one of the nice things about books is that you can kind of, you can kind of go ham. You can go all the way out on everything. Uh, and Tom Holland is the main character in the movie. So if that sells it for you, there you go. The book that I chose is called The Devil All the Time. And it's by Donald Ray Pollock. It came out in 2011. Um, Pollock has written a few other Southern Gothic works, including uh, something called The Heavenly Table in 2016 and Knock 'em Stiff in 2008, which uh, is actually the name of the tiny rural Ohio town that he grew up in. Uh, the concept of growing up in a town called Knock 'em Stiff, great. Already a great story in and of itself. Um, so I will preface this by saying uh, this is a dark novel. Um, not that the others aren't, but it's very much something that wants to revel, I think, in the darkness. Um, and there is definitely a place for it. It's got explicit violence and gore. Um, there are implications of incest, uh, implications of sexual abuse, all manner of really horrible things. It's not a light read. It's not even really a happy read, which isn't something that I always go for. Southern Gothic is is maybe one of the exceptions to that because I like my my post apocalyptic fiction to be very hopeful. I don't necessarily need that with the southern with the southern Gothic. Um, so I'm surprised that this is a book that I would recommend, knowing my <laughs> knowing my own history and the things that I enjoy. Um, but again. The movie might be more palatable for folks as it turn, tones down like a lot of the really intense nastiness that comes from the story also takes out um, any implications of incest. So if that's like the thing that you that will make or break a story for you, maybe maybe that's the way way to go. But 
The story is set in Southern Ohio and West Virginia, just after World War II and sort of stretches into the 1960s. We have a few plot lines that seem only to be connected by geography at first, but by the end, they all pool together like the blood on the grooves of a prayer log. I'm not gonna talk about the events of the story. Instead, I'm gonna talk about the characters we meet. Brother Roy and Brother Theodore are traveling preachers. While they aren't faith healers, Roy is looking to prove the strength of his connection to God. As he pours buckets of spiders over his head, he trusts that God will protect him. As the sureness wanes, he has to cast his gaze around him to find a new worthy sacrifice. Carl and Sandy Henderson were in love once. Now they're together because Sandy has nowhere else to go, and Carl would find a hard time, or he, he would find it a very hard time to encounter another woman who enjoys the same activities that he does. They love picnics and photography and long road trips. Hitchhikers are some of the most interesting people to pick up, because you can learn so much about a man who's grateful to you. Carl figures it's not really infidelity if you're still with them taking pictures, and uh, Sandy's pretty good at hiding the bodies afterwards, too. Sheriff Bodecker, Sandy's brother, is too preoccupied with the upcoming election to really notice that his sister's acting strange, especially when a ghost from the past rolls into town. Which brings us to my favorite of the plot lines and the one that kind of follows our main protagonist. Willard is a World War II veteran, still haunted by the horrifying things he saw in the uh, Pacific Theater. He's come home. He's ready to forget everything that happened. He meets Charlotte, a cute waitress. They fall in love and they have a son named Arvin. He forgets for a while. When his wife falls deathly ill, this blood-soaked man looks to God to save her. Willard and Arvin pray every day at a makeshift altar in the woods. And if they pray hard enough, Arvin's mother might be saved. Their devotion doesn't save her and it leads Willard down a dark path. Arvin has his own path to follow, less dark, but no less steeped in blood. All of the plot threads come together in something that's just as grotesque and dark as you would expect from a Southern Gothic story. Arvin, Willard's son, is kind of the protagonist, and he really, uh, all of the plot lines do, well, while they all intersect at quite a few places, he's really what brings them all together. He's um, a little bit of, I think he's a little bit of idea, an idea as much as he is a character. He's, um, he's kind of a force of nature, I would say. Arvin is, Ar Arvin is quite the interesting um, fellow. His father raised him not to, um, not to take anything from bullies. And there's a lot of people in Knock'em Stiff in the area who might be considered bullies, we'll say. So there you go. The Devil All the Time by Donald Ray Pollock. I would, I would recommend it. I don't think it's, um, well, it makes a lot of comments on the South. I think it, it makes far more on the religious aspect as opposed to, um, as opposed to some of the more, I think, interesting stories we see nowadays that come from uh, the, the Black Southern Gothic genre. This one is very much one that focuses a little more on religion. And I think that might have something to do with the fact that the author himself is also, because he's from rural Ohio, it is a little bit farther north than most Southern Gothic stories that you would kind of think of and didn't have the same type of like antebellum South experience. So, and for to finish my part off with a Gabriel video game recommendation, <laughs> I am going to try and convince you to play one that I think is an indie masterpiece. It is called Kentucky Route Zero, and it is a Southern Gothic magic realism point and click. Steam has this to say about it. Should, should be all you need, fellas. At twilight in Kentucky, as bird songs give way to the choir of frogs and insects, familiar roads become strange and it's easy to get lost. Those who are already lost may find their way to a secret highway winding through underground caves. 
the people who live and work along this highway are themselves a little strange at first, but soon seem familiar. The aging driver makes the last delivery for a doomed antique shop. The young woman who fixes obsolete TVs surrounded by ghosts. The child and his giant eagle companion. The robot musicians. The invisible power company lurking everywhere. And the threadbare communities that struggle against its grip. So that one, really good. Based on the idea of mammoth cave system, if you've heard of it. Um, caves are terrifying. The South is terrifying. This game pretty fun. So consider either picking up uh, the devil all the time or Kentucky Route Zero. All right. And I am going to pass it on to Virginia for our next book. Oh, how is, how is it that I'm not talking about the darkest book in the podcast? This does not make any sense. Anyway, well, okay, so today, um, last week, last week I had kind of recommended two companion novels by the same author. And this week I'm going to recommend half of a book because only half of this book fits the theme because it is a book that contains two stories and one of them is a cosmic horror, the other one a Southern Gothic. So I am recommending the book called A Lush and Seething Hell. Um, and it's by John Horner Jacobs. And in it is the story, My Heart Struck Sorrow. And the title, by the way, is super appropriate for both of the stories in this book. And like a good Southern Gothic, like Gabriel was just telling us, this book definitely forces you to look evil in the eye and deal with it. So this is the story of Cromwell. He is a librarian slash archivist that worked for the Library of Congress. And he has been informed that a collector has passed away. And upon his death, he has left them a substantial and super rare one of a kind type of collection of vinyls. And these are all original recordings of songs of the deep self. And they want Cromwell to go see what they're dealing with and to digitize it, to catalog it, to preserve it. And they figure it's a good project for Cromwell, not just because he has a lot of musical knowledge, but also because this might help him take his mind off the recent deaths of his wife and his son. So together with his assistant, Harriet, they went to the mansion of Harlan Parker. They were given the keys and they were given free reign. The realtor said, you know, we're going to put the house up for sale soon, but everything here is yours. Take whatever you want. Um, you know, whatever you want, just take it. And so they were going around this giant house trying to figure out how they're going to find a way to transport everything back. And then they discover a lock room that is hidden out of sight. And they figure since everything is theirs to take, they're going to break the padlock and see what's inside. And in it was a room full of recordings. They were all meticulously labeled and dated presumably by Harlan Parker himself, and there's a journal. And you know, when you find a random journal in a secret room, it's going to have lots of secrets. It's going to probably contain some unbelievable story. And as Cromwell was standing inside the room, there's this unease. And he keeps thinking, you know, the room is locked, it's hidden, but it doesn't feel like it's a safe or a vault that you're trying to make sure that nobody finds it because of what's inside is valuable. It feels a bit more like it's locked because they want to make sure whatever is inside stays inside and that it can get out. And through the recordings and through the journal, Cromwell starts to piece together the story of Harlan Parker and his unease is definitely justified. After he came back from the war, Harlan Parker spent years traveling the South and trying to record musicians. And he was looking for blues and folk musicians that can play, that can sing songs of the deep South. And he's bringing his sound scriber around, his vinyl pressing machine, and that he would be there, find these musicians wherever they are, 
and try to make them perform for him so that he could record them. And specifically, he is interested in a folk song called Staggerly or Staggerly, depending on the version that he hears. And for some reason, he's obsessed with finding this song and the different versions of it, especially the different lyrics and the different verses that this song has. He always asks his musicians to play this song first, and they all begin with pretty much the same story, a story of a murder. Stagley Shelton was drinking one day with Billy Lyons, and they got into a fight, and Billy took his hat, so Stagley decided to go home, grab his gun, and shot, came back, shot Billy dead, and he was then arrested, convicted of murder, and he was hung. That is sort of how most of the songs begin. As the song's refrain go, Staggerly is a bad man. But there are extra verses to that. And some of the musicians know the story after Staggerly got hung. When he, after death, what happened to him? And Harlan Parker, for whatever reason, is desperate to collect these stories and he needs to hear the rest of the song. Why is Harlan Parker so obsessed with this song? And what drove him to travel all over the South to remote areas to try to find these musicians? And as Cromwell reads on and listens to the recording, he too became obsessed. And that the obsession of Parker is transferred over to Cromwell. And he too is looking for something. And he too is trying to find something. But what, is, what are these two men looking for? The author John Horner Jacobs has been called a quiet master by his colleagues. And you can see why he gets so much respect from all his fellow horror writers. And they all think how he's massively underrated um, just from reading this story and the other one that is in this collection. It was such a page turner that like, I actually, I had a plan to read another book until about yesterday when I was like, I don't actually want to talk about this book. So I had to quickly find something to read. And this one, the 200 pages just flew by. It was so super engaging. First of all, there's this writing. And I think it really embodies the genre of Southern Gothic. The way he writes, there's such economy in it that he would drop in a sentence and sometimes even just the chapter title. And if you scan it and you missed it, then you're going to miss something that will completely change your viewpoint or change your understanding of the story. And I feel like it's very much like when I read a self and Gothic because it's such heat and stickiness, just like what Gabriel started this episode with, that like it blurs between that reality and the imagination and the reality and sort of the supernatural. And it always makes you wonder and you stop and you're like, wait, did I see that? Did I actually see that? Or did I just imagine it? And I feel like that's what his writing does. Like a sentence, a word here and there, you just be like, wait, wait, do you, is he saying what I think he's saying? And you come to the realization, you're like, whoa, like I think this is what happened. And it is such a treat to be able to read a story like that, that requires you to really pay attention. And then there's the characters. And as Fiona said, like, these are not characters that you necessarily like, but somehow he managed to make sort of the characters, even if you don't like them, you still care to read about what happened to them. And you care, like, and, and you feel sympathy for them. Because I think one of one of the things in Southern Gothic for me that I really enjoy is, is all the floor characters and, and how it's like, and, and many of them are just bad people. Um, and they like, it's not just the decay of the setting, but it's also just humanity in general. And it's just evil. And, and you have to like look at it and how I, I read some, when, when I was trying to like, again, same thing, try to read, okay, well, Southern Gothic, like, you know, what is the definition? And, and they talk about how there's such a blur line between the victim and the villain. And I feel like, like for both Cromwell and Harlan Parker, 
both of them have done some bad things. Um, and it's really hard to like try to navigate those two sides of a character. Um, but John um, Honor Jacobs does such a good job so that you feel bad for them. And, and these two people, they're both like, like, like filled with guilt. Um, and that's, you know, and that guilt kind of leads to them this, this obsession that they both have. And both of them are looking for redemption. They're looking for forgiveness, but it's not to be found. They're not going to find it. Um, and, and as they say, the only devils are men, despite that this is a horror novel and there's definitely some supernatural stuff going on, but nothing can be worse than humans sometimes. Um, so, and like I really, really enjoyed the characters in this and, and how they develop. And of course, um, as Gabriel pointed out, you know, Southern Gothic is a genre that really do look at and explore the, the social issues. Um, and unlike Corinne's book, uh, John Horner Jacobs is white. He's a white author. And so he's kind of coming to this from more than an ally's point of view. And you can see that he's very conscious of what he's writing and and what he is saying in his book um, and and um, very much like white tears uh by Hari Kunju that I talk about in another episode um, this is not just about the black experience in the south after the civil war but it's also very much about the exploitation and also the cultural appropriation of music of songs this is a white man Harlan Parker who's trying to go and record songs of mostly black musicians and then we have the library of congress again Cromwell a white man trying to digitize those recordings. So there's a lot of that um, sort of exploration of that topic in this book. Um, as the book said, uh, music is a ritual with the power to transform both the singer and the listener. And I feel very much like this story, writing is the same. This story definitely will transform a reader um, to and make us look evil in the eyes. So um, Highly recommended. I will also recommend to read the other story, which is a cosmic horror. Um, as uh, the foreword by Chuck Wendig pointed out, it is like, you know, if you love Lovecraft story, but you don't want the racist stuff, you know, read this instead. So um, Lush and Seething Hell by John Horner Jacobs. Another one that I have to read. Uh, this, this episode is turning into a problem for me, actually, because my list of things to read is getting longer and longer because every single one of these has sounded amazing. And that one has it's got it all. And it's one of those things that I think a lot of people might have encountered from the Southern Gothic genre without realizing that it's a Southern Gothic story. It reminds me, and it might have even mentioned potentially the story of Robert Johnson, which is a really, really well-known, um, I, I, or I would say that if you are interested in that sort of thing, it's a very well-known story about a musician who went to a crossroads and sold his soul to the devil to be able to play guitar better. But of course, it's one of those ones that it's like, obviously not true. And it's based on a very good song by Robert Johnson called Crossroads. Um, but the, yeah, the way that music and everything, I think can kind of feed into it and also a way to explore um, like you said, cultural appropriation, but also the way that um, stories can be handed down is really, really, really cool. All right. And I'm going to give it over to Mark for our last book of the episode. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. So today I'm going to be talking about a uh, Crooked Letter, Crooked Letter by Tom Franklin. Um, and in this novel is very much like a split narrative novel where it takes place both in the present as well as the past. So the idea of the past influencing the present and the after effects of the past influencing the present is very much an important aspect of this novel. And the novel itself takes place in a small town in rural Mississippi called Cabot. And this city has very much been in decline in the recent decades. It used to be a somewhat flourishing city, but Businesses have been closing, industries moving away, and now really the only remaining uh, industry is the lumber industry, as dominated by this one family called the Rutherford family that is sort of ominously referred to throughout the novel as like the sort of ever-present economic force, but isn't really seen all that much within the actual narrative, just kind of interesting. But in this story, we sort 
the main one of the two main characters is the lone remaining patrolling police officer in the city, Silas Jones, who, as the author also reminds us, may also be the last remaining black man in town, as the city used to have a much more, uh, how should we say, interracial population, whereas now it's very much dwindled down to mostly just a holdout white population. And Silas primarily spent his day just doing the average sort of cop duties, giving out traffic tickets and checking parking meters and all that stuff. Maybe every now and again, he'll be called to remove a rattlesnake from a mailbox or something like that. But for the most part, his days are not all that busy. Suddenly, this will all change, however, once the a large uptake in crime suddenly occurs, which begins with the sudden and unexpected disappearance of the oldest daughter of the Rutherford family. Uh, after weeks of searching for this missing person, no one knows what has happened to her, and she's essentially presumed to have been murdered. Um, soon afterwards, there's another sudden murder, this time of the local marijuana dealer, Morton Morissette, or Eminem, as he's colloquially referred to in the community. Um, and then soon after, the local mechanic, Larry Ott, who we'll get back to in a minute, who's a very important character, is also found shot in his home and near death. Now, this Larry Ott character is a very infamous person in the community because several decades earlier, he had taken a, another young girl, a young girl out on a date, and she never returned home. Everyone always asked him what happened to her, but he always maintained that he never actually went on a date with this person, Cindy Walker. He was only a cover for her to go out with her boyfriend. And he's always maintains innocence. However, the community has sort of remained very suspicious of him as he's sort of become like a social outcast in the community because of this sort of suspicion that's hung over him for decades. Um, and Silas is the person who sort of discovers Larry's body in his home and sort of takes them back to their time when they were ch in their childhood because Silas and Larry were actually close friends for a short period of time in the 1970s when they were in middle school and then later on in high school. But however, being an interracial friendship, this was not a sort of common thing in this part of the state. Um, segregation was still not officially enforced, but it was very much unofficially sort of regulated through friendships and relationships and things like that. It was very much taboo for these two people to be close friends. And we sort of get to see this friendship of theirs through uh, interspersed, flash, interspersed flashbacks to the 1970s. We get to see them as they were friends like out in the wilderness because Larry's family owned very large portions of land that there was pretty much untouched that they could just do whatever on. They could go hunting, they'd go fishing. They'd spend all their days together as very close friends. And alongside this, we sort of get an idea of what their home life was like because Larry sort of lived a more sort of quote unquote traditional American family with like a father, a mother, the sort of nuclear family. They got like a middle class lifestyle. They own land, they own a home. Whereas Silas's family, he lives with a single mother. His father is in prison. Um, they live in a very small cabin on land that's owned by Larry's family. So you sort of get to see like this sort of stark contrast in their living conditions and how that's related to their class and race. Um, and I sort of found that to be the most interesting aspect of these sort of flashback scenes. You get to see how their lives are impacted by the sort of social conditions that they're growing up in. And in, back into the present, we sort of get to see how Silas sort of goes about trying to think about how their friendship sort of split apart at one point. I'm not gonna say what happened, but essentially their friendship ends very abruptly because of a series of incidents. And then back into the present, Silas is trying to think about how, um, what happened with Larry being blamed for the sort of kidnapping or murder or disappearance of this one girl and how this sort of is related to the current uh, string of crimes that's ongoing and how that he can, how can he try and find a way to solve these crimes and sort of reconnect with Larry over the years? Because something he's always been wanting to do. Larry has recently even reached out to him prior to this um, attempt on his life to try and reconnect with Silas. So then this is sort of like the background that's sort of going on as 
we sort of come into the present. Um, I'm not going to spoil anything that happens with the actual mystery aspects of the novel, but um, it does sort of come to a satisfying conclusion as you sort of get to see how um, Silas pursues his own uh, his own approach to these crimes based on his own sort of like intuitions and uh, experiences in the community. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's sort of like the the gist of <laughs> the narrative. Um, I would say if you're interested in a more sort of narrative driven, uh, introspective narrative, you'd enjoy this because we sort of get Silas's own um, present and past uh, narrative narration of events as well as Larry's. Larry's is primarily focused in the past when he was friends with Silas in the seventies, but we also into the present uh, later on in the novel, we also get to see his own perspective in the present. So very much this sort of dual timeline, dual narration aspect of the story I found very interesting. Um, and if you're sort of interested in that kind of uh, story or uh, narration style, then I think that you'd find this a very interesting read. It sounds like another story where really mm -hmm. you can you can explore that sometimes the dark stuff is within us as much as it is within society uh well thank you everybody uh for all of these great books that i'm immediately going to put on a to be read list whether or not i read them always a very big question with me whether or not <laughs> i see if there's a movie probably not the case with most of these so I might have to read them because I want to I want to see the stories. So if you're new to the genre, I hope that you will try out a Southern Gothic novel soon. If you're an old fan, hopefully we found something new for you to see, sink your teeth into. So thanks for listening and we will see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.